amid the network of U.S. intelligence gathering organizations is the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, known in government circles as NGA. As one of the newer agencies, it's perhaps lesser known to the general public than its intelligence community counterparts, but that hasn't stopped it from being a key player in several high-profile successes, from helping to take out Osama bin Laden to providing real-time battleground data for U.S. warfighters. Now, in its 20th year of existence, NJ is marking this milestone with a campaign called GeoInt on the Rise, a celebration of the vibrant future of geospatial intelligence. Despite the fanfare, it was a bumpy road at first, says Rear Admiral Jack Dantone, the former director of NGA's predecessor, the National Imagery and Mapping Agency. So you had the distinction of being the first director of NEMA. Can you tell me about the state of the cultures when NEMA came together? The big issue was the Department of Defense was worried about the intelligence community taking away their map making capability, and the intelligence community was worried about the Department of Defense taking away their imagery analysis capability. That notion had to be dispelled before we could really move ahead. Literally, the week after we were stood up, sat down with the leadership, and I said, all right, let's have the parties, but let's get through that, because it won't be long when the knives would come out. And I said, the only way we're going to be defended from those knives is to be defended by our customers. So focus on our customers. Make them happy. The second piece, we had a system called IDEX, which was used in DMA a lot in map production. Very serial, very tedious. Took a long time to build the topographical line map, like months and months. It was a serial production scheme that separated elements of the workforce. And one day, uh, someone looked at me and said, you know, we really need to go see some video experts. I went, oh, really, do we? And they went, yes, we do. So we're going to Hollywood. So we packed up and we went out to an outfit called Cinebase. We saw their workstations, their server, drawing from a common database, and that's how they did their work. And whereas IDEX costs in the millions, these workstations cost 15000 a piece. So we had to have one of those. So we bought one, brought it back, we set it up, and literally within two or three weeks built that product, which in the past had taken us five to six months. And I really believe that it was those two things, customer focus and the transition to networking equipment, that made all the difference. What do you feel is your legacy as a director of NEMA? What I would like to be remembered for is as being that little grain of sand, which you and I know has to exist inside of an oyster before the oyster can produce a pearl. So I like to think of myself as that little grain of sand. Next, we travel to Salt Lake City, Utah, to sit down with NEMA's second director, Lieutenant General James King. We started by asking him about an initiative to standardize and improve NEMA's functions, known as Workforce 21, as well as an address he made declaring war on negative attitudes. By 2001, the culture wars were pretty well non-existent. Uh, NEMA had, was responding to its customers in an outstanding fashion. But at the time in 2001 when I addressed the leaders, we were failing. So it was a plea to the people, dressed in combat arms, uniform, to plea with them, make Workforce 21 a task, act like it was a customer task and make it happen. The people did. It was never perfect, but they implemented it, and it prepared us to move forward to accomplish those things we needed to do. We also discussed NEMA's partnership with NASA on the Shuttle Radar Topography Mission and the successes it achieved. SRTM was one of the best geospatial information intelligence collection resources that had been used in the history of intelligence and mapping. It was able then to provide 
that near global mapping of the earth that supported not only intelligence needs, but it became a valuable and needed tool to also provide products to search and rescue and other areas in the academic and civil world that needed the same type of information to protect American lives. And what does he hope to be remembered for as a director of NEMA? NEMA became operationalized. We became recognized and sought after as a Department of Defense Combat Support Agency and were recognized and accepted as an equal partner in the intelligence community. Current Director of National Intelligence, Lieutenant General James Clapper, took the helm of NEMA in 2001 mere days after the September 11th attacks? Well, I took over uh, two days after 9-11, on the uh, 13th of September uh, 2001. And this wasn't specific to NEMA. It was, I think, it uh, pervaded the entire intelligence community. And, and, and I think one question we all had was, is there going to be more of this? Are there more attacks coming? I was still in the kind of prep mode, and, and General King and I had talked about delaying uh, the changeover from him to me uh, until the, the situation was clearer to us. Again, we were concerned about more attacks, and uh, DOD said no, uh, the changeover was going to occur as planned, and so uh, I ended up as director, and that was it. Can you tell me a bit about how NEMA transformed into NGA? The transformation of NGA from NEMA uh, is a journey. I asked the leadership, is it time to stop singing Amazing Grace at the wake of DMA and NIMPIC? And let's meld these organizations because the two were separate. They were under the banner of NEMA, but they were, uh, uh, from a production standpoint, were two separate structures, two separate bureaucracies. Even the name, NEMA, perpetuated the division. Na the National Imagery and Mapping Agency, as though those were two separate endeavors. And so that was, okay, uh, we're going to buy into the notion of GeoInt, and ergo, we need to change the name of the agency. And the consensus was, yes, we should do that. And so that's what led to uh, the seeking of legislation to change the name and buying into the notion of uh, GeoInt. In the run-up to that, I was director of DIA, and of course, I fought the creation of such an agency tooth and nail. So it's a lesson in where you stand depends where you sit, uh, you know. Uh, but I do think it was, uh, it was the right thing to do. And so looking back on the history, I think uh, I'm very proud of uh, what NGA has become as a key major uh, component of the uh, United States intelligence community and uh, it is, is having a huge impact and I'm, I'm very proud to see that. So what do you feel is your legacy as the NGA director? Well, I suppose uh, I'll be identified with embracing the notion of geospatial intelligence. That is the melding of imagery and imagery analysis and mapping and charting and geodesy into a single discipline. So I guess if I was you know, going to pick one thing probably uh, that I, I might be remembered for, it would be that. We ventured to New York to meet with former NGA director, Vice Admiral Robert Moret who now teaches at Syracuse University's Maxwell School. We talked about his implementation of NGA support teams and his goal of bringing the agency as close to the warfighter as possible. The NGA support teams did get a lot of emphasis during the time I was uh, director, but I think it was a logical evolution of the uh, NSTs that had been established during uh, Jim Clapper's time when he was director and also one that responded to the demands of the time, uh, which we found ourselves in between, you know, after I got there in 2006. There was a tremendous willingness by the NGA workforce to move out in some of the toughest, toughest missions we had. They were able to get in uh, to the mission space of so many key people that uh, help us out with our national security and that of our, our key allies. And it's been great to see that continue into the future. 
We also asked about the groundbreaking and construction of the NGA facility in Springfield, Virginia, and what the new campus meant to NGA as a whole. The NCE was about a lot more than bricks and mortar. It was about bringing together the GON team in the national capital region and uh, reducing a lot of the inefficiencies we had for being sprinkled throughout uh, the Washington, D.C. area, and also fully partnering with our um, key presence in St. Louis, Missouri, at Arnold, and both the Second Street facility and all the other places around the world where we were located. So the impact of the NCE went well beyond just the, the building itself. It was about being more effective uh, beyond the building and the impact that we had in so many different places around the world. As far as his legacy, he says it all comes down to teamwork. I think during the period I was the director, what we did as a team um, was to work extremely effectively with the leadership group that we had there at NGA, uh, that we responded as effectively as possible to the challenges of the time and looking to the future based on strategic uh, threats that we've got to the United States. Uh, that we, we did focus outward and embedded ourselves with other organizations to provide them the best possible support they could have uh, from NGA. But that was very much a team effort. I don't see any of that as, as a personal legacy, but as a response to some things that were happening during that four-year period and the willingness of the leadership team and all uh, the people of NGA, um, you know, men and women, contractor, government, military, uh, to come together and uh, meet the demands of the day. Our next stop was the home of Letitia Long, who was director of NGA when U.S. forces took out al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden. We asked her to describe the experience and NGA's critical role in that effort. I'll never forget this day. It was about two weeks after I had become the director. My executive assistant came in and he said, ma'am, the head of analysis and a couple of analysts are here to see you. I know they don't have an appointment, but it's really important. And I don't know what it is they want to talk to you about. <laughs> they won't tell me. So they came in, we closed the door, and that's when they laid out some imagery of the compound and said, we think this is where bin Laden is. I, I was speechless. The compound was very different than anything else in the area. It was about eight times as large as anything else. The walls of the compound were 12 feet, even in, in some places, 18 feet high. Very unusual for this area. The president, as we all know, approved the operation and it occurred. NGA was very involved also in the planning of the operation. So very proud of the work that was done across the whole agency and, of course, across the community. I mean, it's a great example of working as an integrated team. Can you tell me about putting the power of GON in the hands of the users? So the vision of putting the power of GON in the hands of the user actually came from the workforce and from our customers. From our own analysts, I would hear, it's so hard to find our data. It's all locked up in different databases and I spend all my time looking for information. And from our customers, I would hear, we love NGA. We love what you do. You guys are so proactive. You know, you're, you're in our footprint. You understand our needs. But if we want to try and find things on our own, it's really hard to navigate your websites. It's really hard to unlock the power of GeoIn. If we could do that and serve ourselves for the easy things, then we could rely on you to be doing that tough analysis. And so from that became putting the power of GeoIn in the hands of the user. Everything we focused on with our strategy, with the objectives, was all working towards that, you know, over the ensuing time that, that I was the director. So what would you say is your legacy? Um, I hope I will be remembered as someone who took care of the employees and that enabled them to reach their full potential. That it was a culture where relationships mattered. If you take care of your people, your people will take care of the mission. And, you know, I, I like to say people first, mission always. But it's all about the people. Last but not least, we caught up with current NGA director Robert Cardillo to discuss an initiative he calls Succeeding in the Open and his thoughts on risk-taking at NGA. As the world becomes more and more transparent, NGA needs to move into a space that takes advantage of that transparency 
and takes what will be common data and use it in uncommon ways. Part of my intent in crafting the Succeed in the Open was to build on that success. It wasn't like we were moving from failure to success. We're moving from success to success. It's just in a different environment. And so I wanted to do both. I wanted to both celebrate our past, but then instill some excitement about where we need to go. And that is, in fact, on top of this new, open, more transparent environment in which we live. There was a time in which we controlled the advancement of our profession. It was, it was an inside game. I would argue today, and I'm sure tomorrow, that the advances in our profession will happen outside more than in. That's not a bad thing. That's not a scary thing. It's just happening. So in order for us to leverage what's happening on the outside, we're going to have to get out of that comfort zone that I was raised in. We're going to have to accept additional risk as we make those engagements. Because I believe the upside of those risks is much greater than ever before. And his legacy? I would hope that as people look back on my tenure as director, that they would see a pivot point, that we were able to make the transition, technical, but at least as important mentally, to take advantage of the open geospatial information environment. We've set the conditions. We've created the space. We've incentivized some of the risks that I've talked about earlier. Now it's time to deliver. It's time to execute. It's time to to fulfill the potential we've been talking about. So what I'm excited about now at this point is that, is that we can stop talking and start showing. GeoInt has increased speed, clarity, and access to information. And speed is life. Geospatial intelligence reduces the uncertainty for decision makers by allowing them to visualize any place on the Earth. GeoInt recognizes the fact that everything and everybody has to be someplace. By being the baseline for all other analysis that takes place and being the foundation for the way we look at things around the globe. GeoInt has changed the very way we, we interact with one another, with our phones, with our tablets. I mean, just the very way we go about our lives every single day. Geospatial intelligence is the frame for our understanding of everything.